laid waste without house or harbor. From the land of Cyprus, it is revealed to them. All right. Well, let's pray and we'll get into the passage. All right. Lord, we thank you for this evening and we thank you for those watching online, for those that are here in this room. And we pray that you would um, show us your ways, Lord, reveal this oracle to us that we might understand what is written here and be able to apply it to our lives today. And we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And then just a quick reminder too, this Saturday, men's breakfast at 8 a.m. right in the student ministry building behind this one and then uh, the next weekend will be a women's event which is going to be a women's uh, herb event it was going to be a lavender event at the lavender farm but now it's going to be a special event here at PCF all right so we're in chapter 23 of Isaiah in our country, we are so used to um, great food and goods from all over the world. You know, it comes to us from every country and we can find in the grocery store all sorts of vegetables um, in season and out of season. And so um, we have so many things available to us. Uh, So much so that, you know, we have things like coffee. You know, coffee is grown in other parts of the world. And I love coffee. We have so much coffee that I've turned into a coffee snob over the years. And I have my particular way of making it and my particular brands and roasts that I like. Um, But imagine what would happen to our society if we could not get coffee beans. I mean, it would be nuts for a couple weeks at least. Um, People would be coming apart at the seams. But... Also, what if we couldn't get microchips for cars and smartphones or gasoline for our vehicles or fresh vegetables and fruit that we have right now, like strawberries all year round, you know, I mean, all these things that we're so used to, avocados, anytime we want them. But supply chain disruptions remind us of how vulnerable we actually are in our way of life is. And we are actually dependent on trade around the world to support our large population centers and to provide the kind of life that we live today. And so that reality of how, um, how easy it is for that system to fall apart makes us reassess, makes us think about what is life truly about. How much of what we consider life today is dependent on a system that could fall apart. Well, today's oracle concerning Tyre is that exact thing. Tyre is a city. It's not speaking of an actual tire of a car. It's (laughs) T-Y-R-E. And so Tyre reminds me of where our society is at today. And here in chapter 23, God's able to humble the richest nation on the earth. The Phoenicians are the people group where the city of Tyre is from. It was a great economic superpower of its day. Tyre and Sidon are synonymous with materialism. And so we'll see this in the way that they uh, were masters of trade around the world. But God can humble our rich country just as he humbled theirs. And so they had a system um, that was contingent on trade and shipping and all of these parts and pieces to bring in the goods and distribute food around all the known world, especially the Mediterranean, as we'll see today. Um, Now, as we look in verse 1, it says, The oracle concerning Tyre. This concludes 10 messages to specific nations from God that began in chapter 13 on to 23 that we're seeing today. And so, Tyre, where is it at? Well, if you see this map, you can see 
On the right side, on the east side of the Mediterranean, is Tyre, north of that, Sidon, and um, Byblos, which these are the three main cities of Phoenicia. Um, and so this area was just northwest of Israel, very close to the nation, and they were still considered part of the land of Canaan. So we'll see them referred to as Canaan in a little while in our passage today. But we have a lot more in common with these people than many realize. Our alphabet comes from the Phoenicians, you know, that's where we get the word phonetic from. So they, they actually invented an alphabet instead of representing language with hieroglyphics, they were the first so-called first society to put together an alphabet that represented sounds that put together words. So hooked on phonics began <laughs> back there in Tyre. Um, their wealth and influence it was similar, although on a smaller scale, but similar to the United States today. They were master seafaring traders. Um, they had cutting edge sailing technology. They traded as far as Spain, Britain, um, Africa, and other places beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which would be at the very west side of the Mediterranean between Northern Africa and Spain, that little strait of Gibraltar there. Um, that's where people believe the Pillars of Hercules are located on both sides of that strait. And so, it's believed that the Phoenicians would go out of the Mediterranean Sea in their ships all the way down into Africa. Uh, some people think as far as India. But they had a monopoly on shipping and trade around the Mediterranean and they would bring back many wonderful things from around the world. And so like our world, uh, they got used to living in luxury because of the Phoenicians bringing all these goods from all over, the, all over the world. Now, I've got a picture here of a ship, Phoenician ship. Um, there was a shipwreck recovered that was, is believed to be from the 14th century BC. That's 1,400 BC. It was found off the coast of Turkey, and it was carrying 10 tons of copper, one ton of tin, one ton of resin for incense, raw glass, and a lot of other precious goods. Some historians believe that the tin was brought from Britannia, you know, apparently Britannia means land of tin, I didn't know that, but, um, and then some even believe copper was mined in the New World, you know, uh, around the Great, Lake, Great Lakes region, uh, and brought over by the Phoenicians, you know. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but they got copper, tin, all sorts of things coming in. At times, they were friendly with Israel, but not always a good influence on Israel, just like our country. At times, we're friendly with Israel, but not always a good influence. Uh, there's a lot of prophecies against the Phoenicians in the Old Testament, against Tyre and Sidon, because of their major influence of idolatry in the land of Canaan. One of the most wicked kings of Israel, King Ahab, was influenced greatly by Tyre and Sidon. In um, 1 Kings 16.31, it says, And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and this is speaking of Ahab, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, so Sidon, Tyre, um, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And so you see this alliance through Ahab's marriage with Jezebel, a Sidonian princess, it actually led to the promotion of Baal worship in Israel. So you can see why there are a lot of prophecies against them. But we see in the rest of verse 1, a call to mourn. It says, Wail, O ships of Tarshish. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> ships of Tarshish. 
Sound like Sean Connery. <laughs> For Tyre has laid waste without house or harbor. From the land of Cyprus, it is revealed to them. And so we see these ships of Tarshish referred to. They were great sailing vessels that crossed oceans, crossed seas. Uh, Tarshish was a distant key port in the Phoenician trade route, and it was believed to be in Spain. Remember the story of Jonah? You know, when he wanted to run away from God, he looked for the farthest place he knew of, and he decided he was going to hop on a ship to Tarshish. You know, and so he thought, man, I'm going to go to the end of the earth, get away from God's call. Um, but, of course, we know the rest of that story. Tarshish would have been the first stop back in the Mediterranean if they had gone out of this, the um, pillars of Hercules into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Tarshish would be the first stop as they return. It would also be the last stop before going out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, in my mind, I think of it like being the concept of a moon base. You know, if we want to go mine asteroids or go to the uh, to Mars or whatever, a manned mission to Mars, uh, they want to establish a moon base first so that there's this place you can stop and refuel and, and get ready um, to head out further. So in my mind, that's what Tarshish is. Uh, filled with many wonderful things from all over the world, these ships of Tarshish. Um, King Solomon actually had a fleet of these ships and we're given a description of the kinds of things that were put in their holds. It says in 1 Kings 10, 22, for the king had a fleet of ships of Tarshish at sea with the fleet of Hiram. And Hiram was a king in um, Phoenicia. Once every three years, the fleet of ships of Tarshish used to come and bring gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So where did they go for three years? Man, all over the place, you know. Uh, Africa and India and who knows. But there's a call to wail. Wail for Tyre is laid waste. The word of Tyre's fall reaches the fleet of ships. And this fleet of ships of Tarshish are near Cyprus. Cyprus was a closer key port on the Phoenician trade route. It would have been maybe the first stop on its way out towards the Atlantic. Um, but it's there that they suddenly get the horrifying news from land that Tyre has been destroyed. And so for some of these sailors, it was their home, their family, their city was gone. For others... They didn't live there, you know, that were sailors. It was their livelihood, which was now in danger. But the major supply chain had been now disrupted, and society as they know it would change. And verse 2, Be still, O inhabitants of the coast. The merchants of Sidon who cross the sea have filled you. And on many waters your revenue was the grain of Shihor, the harvest of the Nile. You were the merchants of the nations. And so notice it's talking about be still, O inhabitants of the coast. Um, it makes most sense to me that, you know, this could be referring to the sailors on the ship that it was just mentioned. Um, but it could also refer to any one of those port cities, but especially Phoenicia where they lived along the coast. Um, it mentions here Sidon, which was the original capital of Phoenicia, but over time, Tyre surpassed its importance because of the economy that it generated, and it became so rich and influential that Tyre became the focus, although they might not have been the capital city, and is actually kind of a similar thing in, in China. Um, I believe Beijing is the capital city, and then the biggest, most, uh, uh, the busiest port of China is Shanghai. <laughs> Almost forgot. So here, um, Sidon is located north of Tyre on the Mediterranean coast. 
And you'll always see these words paired together. Tyre and Sidon in Old Testament poetry because they are the most prominent Phoenician cities that represent the whole region. Now it talks about them filling, filling their ships with revenue, um, which was the grain of Shihor. What in the world is Shihor? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's the fertile, it's believed to be, no, nobody's really sure where this is at, but it's believed to be a fertile branch of the Nile River on the northeast part of the delta. So when the Nile flows north into the Mediterranean, it fans out. And so there's this huge area of uh, um, deposit, and the Nile breaks up into multiple branches. And so this is believed to be on the northeast portion of that delta that empties into the Mediterranean. One of the um, most prominent cargo of the Phoenicians was the grain from Egypt. And so they would load up at this location. Egypt was known as the breadbasket of the Mediterranean, supp supplying grain to areas around Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. So notice what it says. You were the merchant of the nations. They played this important role around the known world and especially with regards to their food supply. So the fact that this is happening, this tragedy to Tyre and the ships of Tarshish are happening, the whole world is going to be disrupted with regards to their food. Assyrian or Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt may have been the military superpowers of the day, but Phoenicia made the world rich economically. And so there was this economic symbiosis with Phoenicia and all the nations in the area. Um, and through that, um, Tyre and Sidon had like an influence um, on the nations because global trade brings a certain level of peace <clears throat> when people are dependent on the trade for food and the goods that they enjoy. You know, you don't want to go to war with the country that provides your favorite coffee because then you won't have it anymore. So there's something to be lost, right? So people um, most likely treated Phoenicia well because of the trade and the food supply. But when it gets disrupted, that relative peace is broken. And so we see now shame. Shame of the Phoenicians because of losing their prestige, power, and possessions. In verse 4, Be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea has spoken. The stronghold of the sea saying, I have neither labored nor given birth. I have neither reared young men nor brought up young women. Well, why does the sea speak to them? It was because the Phoenicians claimed to be children of the sea. They're like, you know, we're from the ocean. You know, we're special people. Um, but now the sea disowns them. You know, the sea's going, nah, you didn't come from me. Um, you were never my children. In verse 5, when the report comes to Egypt, they will be in anguish over the report about Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish, wail, O inhabitants of the coast. So here we got two areas that are going to be really upset about their supply chain disruption, uh, the fall of Tyre, and that is Egypt and Tarshish. Egypt and Tarshish were the largest trading posts or ports. <laughs> thinking of the frontier, but uh, largest trading po ports in the Mediterranean. And so ships would go from um, Tyre to Cyprus to Egypt to Tarshish. And so you notice those are the countries that are mentioned, Cyprus, Egypt, Tarshish. So it's like the, the ships that received the bad news is going from place to place sharing um, this horrible news with all these countries. Egypt, when they hear about it, they're upset because their economy 
is based in agriculture, and so they were dependent on Tyre to distribute their grain. And without that distribution, they, didn't, they weren't able to make money. But then Tarshish, being in Spain, they would suffer economically as the goods stopped flowing through their port. Um, and so they were, so they were mourning about it. In verse 7, is this your exultant city whose origins is from days of old, whose feet carried her to settle far away? And so here's this question. Is this that exultant city, that, that place that was just full of wealth and joy, uh, who had this ancient origin and a rich history, is this the city that's fallen? Um, and then it talks about this city settling far away, that the Phoenicians that established colonies around the world. You know, there's another similarity to um, our world today, perhaps, is because of their trade, those colonies around the world um, are going to be impacted because of Tyre's defeat. Well, the second thing we see here is God's purpose behind Tyre's fall. You know, I mean, it sounds pretty horrible. For the Mediterranean, it sounds pretty horrible. For the Phoenicians. But why is God doing this? In verse 8, Who has purposed this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honored of the earth? The Lord of hosts has purposed it to defile the pompous pride of all glory, to dishonor all the honored of the earth it says tire the bestower of crowns you know have you ever heard the term kingmaker you know somebody that has the influence or saw themselves as that as kingmakers of the world or so they thought they were merchants um, or i'm sorry their merchants were considered like princes because they were so rich they were the, the richest and most powerful people in the world. It's like in our country. Think of the richest people on the face of the earth um, today that have some of the greatest influence, like Jeff Bezos of Amazon or Bill Gates um, from Microsoft, My Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook or Elon Musk from Tesla. You know, all these guys, I mean, two of those guys are expanding into space travel. You know, I mean, they're... They're influencing science and politics and technology and the economy. Um, their influence touches really not only our country, but every part of the world. That's what these merchants of Tyre are like. I mean, we don't know these merchants' names, but we do know they have great influence and great riches and great power because of that. But the Lord of hosts is the one who is able to take this great, powerful, influential um, economic superpower and destroy it. So there's this question here. You know, who has purposed this? Who is behind this? Who could do such a thing and, and remove this powerful nation that seems immovable, you know, they seem untouchable. Isn't that the way we feel about our country today? I mean, I think we can relate a lot with perhaps how they felt. Um, well, the answer to the question is Yahweh of hosts. You know, the Lord of angel armies. He's the one that can take down a superpower. And here he's defiling the pompous pride of all glory. I mean, that's an awesome line, you got to say. Uh, defiling the pompous pride of all glory. Which means their wealth, their influence, their prestige and pride will be made putrid. That's the picture. It'll turn nasty. I just cleaned my gutters this week. Um, the gutter of my house, which for three years I've looked at it overflowing and I haven't had the energy, you know, for you, you guys know why, um, to do that. 
And, but I finally did it this week. And it was about this thick with algae and goop. And I, I haven't smelled something that bad in a long time, you know. Um, after cleaning it out, my hands just stunk. And I washed them like 10 times and the smell wouldn't go away. Um, took a couple days. And it was just like stuck in my nostrils. You know, everywhere I went, I felt like I was smelling it. But it was putrid. You know, there were dead slugs in there and, and <laughs> all kinds of crazy things. That's what it's talking about here, that God's going to defile the pompous pride of all glory. And so we've learned so far that pride is the chief sin of the nations and of mankind, really. It's often equated with Satan's downfall. And so we've talked before about the king of Babylon and how we imagined a stage with this big backdrop picture of Satan. And on the stage in front was the king of Babylon taking the stage of history for a time, but behind these world powers is Satan. And then and then the, the scene changes, you know, the curtain goes down, comes back up, and there's another picture. It's Satan again, but just in a different scene. And then a different king comes forth and spends time on the, the world stage. And so in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, we saw the king of Babylon, and it said this. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You who said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And so those five I will statements, the pentagram of pride. But you are brought low, you're brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. And so that is the outcome of the pride of the king of Babylon. But now the king of Tyre takes the stage in Ezekiel 28. And so I wanted to read to you the larger portion of this passage, now knowing um, a little bit more about Tyre and its influence and its wealth. Maybe this makes more sense when we read Ezekiel 28. It says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas, you know, because they're a seafaring nation. Yet you are but a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. You know, so they had technology. They had wisdom of things all over the world. No secret is hidden from you by your wisdom and your understanding. You have made wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. But or by your great wisdom in your trade, you have increased your wealth and your heart has become proud in your wealth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you make your heart like the heart of a God. Therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile, there's that word again, defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas." Will you still say I am a God in the presence of those who kill you? Though you are but a man and no God in the hands of those who slay you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners. For I have spoken, declares the Lord. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. And here's the passage that likens him to Satan. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. 
Sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On that day, you, cr you were created. They were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst. And you sinned, so I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was pr proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you by the multitude of your iniquities. In the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought fire out from your midst and consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the nations are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. So ultimately, Tyre will be humbled, and yet God will be glorified, you know? And so... Any nation that takes such pride in themselves, God is going to deal with them. And so that is humbling to think about, isn't it? When we think of our own nation, the more prideful we get, the more rebellious and self-confident we get. This act has played out many times in world history. Well, in verse 10 it says, cross over your land like the Nile. O daughter of Tarshish, cross over your land like the Nile. Now, when it talks about that phrase, people during the destruction of these Phoenician cities will flood out of the cities into the land, you know. Um, they will be, few, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? People running from war to get out of there. Fugitives. <laughs> I can't remember what I'm thinking about. Anyway. <laughs> um, so they're going to be fleeing. And the picture is the Nile overflowing with water. And so as the Nile overflows its banks... Um, into the rich river delta, so will be the people flooding out of these cities. Um, and it even gives the illusion to them leaving technology, in a sense, and returning to the old agricultural way of life to survive. Um, but it, then it goes on. There is no restraint anymore. No restraint anymore. Literally, it is saying there's no girdle or there's no waistband, which is kind of a weird picture. But what it means is there's no restraining force to hold back God's judgment. And so they're powerless to resist what is coming. Um, it's similar to what we read last week in Isaiah 22.8, where it says he has taken away the covering of Judah. Um, that idea of, you know, there's no waistband, so things are going to be falling out, you know. <laughs> things are coming, coming forth and you can't stop it. Um, and then it goes on. He has stretched out his hand over the sea and he has shaken the kingdoms. The Lord has given command concerning Canaan to destroy its strongholds. He stretched out his hand over the sea, refers to God's sovereign hand of judgment. And so there, there's this picture of God's hand being stretched out. And we've talked about this phrase before in relation to judgment. But the fact that it's over the seas is pretty um, picturesque in terms of the symbolism. Because the sea is a place of chaos, of primeval forces represented by the sea. It also represents the nations. It represents... Sheol, you know, all these 
chaotic powers, um, but God's hand is stretched out over it like his sovereignty controls it. It's similar to what um, Moses did when God showed his power over the Red Sea in Exodus 14, 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And so see that picture as his hand goes out and the Lord drove the sea back the strong east wind all night it made the sea dry land and the waters were divided so in the same way this nation that represents the sea god's hand is able to overcome it and judge it and it goes on that he has shaken the kingdoms and we've heard all about that since chapter 13 right um, God's judgment upon the kingdoms of the earth. And then it says concerning Canaan to destroy its strongholds. So remember again, you know, Phoenicia is part of the land of Canaan. But God's going to destroy its strongholds. You know, when you think of a stronghold, a stronghold is a place you run to for safety. You know, if you know that there's a tornado coming, you go to your storm shelter. Um, that's a stronghold. Uh, God removes everything that the people place their confidence in, what they orient their lives around, um, their strongholds, literally or figuratively. Um, and so they have nothing to protect them if they don't have the Lord. In verse 12, and he said, you will no more exult. You're not going to be rejoicing anymore. O oppressed virgin daughter of Sidon, arise. Cross over to Cyprus, even there you will have no rest. Sidon is told that they will not feel safe no matter where they go. Um, they're called an oppressed virgin, which gives the picture of the new oppressor that destroyed Tyre. Although it didn't destroy Sidon, Sidon will be afraid of their new oppressor. And so they will bug out. You know, they're going to go into other areas to get away from this new oppressor. In one of those places is Cyprus, which you would think is a friendly place because they're a close port that they've had relationships with for centuries. The closest trade partner and ally over the years. But I imagine because they won't find rest even there among their supposed friends. It's because they were only friendly, perhaps, because of the wealth that they brought. But suddenly, because of the disruption to their society, you know, they're, they're not real excited about these Sidonians, these Phoenicians coming to their place. And so they're like a people without a home, with no friends in the world, you know. I sometimes wonder what other countries will do if we're ever in trouble. Um, the United States, right? You know, we help a lot of places out, um, but when it comes down to it, will they help us? And for Tyre and Sidon, the answer was no, you're not going to find help anywhere. Um, except for in the Lord, of course. Well, in verse 13, we see that Babylon will besiege and conquer conquer Tyre. Behold, the land of the Chaldeans, which is the Babylonians, this is the people that was not Assyria destined it for wild beasts. And so Babylon's presented as an object lesson here. It's like Isaiah's telling the people of Tyre, let's look and remember a little bit of history here. Babylon was conquered by the Assyrians. So see how easily a superpower can bring another powerful country to ruin. And just like Babylon fell, the warning is, Tyre, you are not immune to the same thing. And so the people that was not refers to Babylon that was destroyed, but then was rebuilt. And they become the new superpower. And so it says here, they erected their siege towers. So here comes Babylon into Tyre. They stripped her places bare. They made her a ruin. 
Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is laid waste. In the 500s BC, Babylon besieged Tyre for 13 years um, after the fall of Jerusalem, and it eventually overcame them. And so they're told here, Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is laid waste. Again, this idea of a stronghold being taken away in an instant. In verse 15, in that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, like the days of one king. Because 70 years was the average lifespan, and in particular, the lifespan of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the prostitute. But you guys know that song, right? No? <laughs> Not one I'd try to remember. But uh, it says, take a heart. Go about the city, O forgotten prostitute. Make sweet melodies. Sing many songs that you may be remembered. Okay, so we're talking about a 70-year period where Tyre will experience decline. Um, the 70 years might be a reference to the years of Babylonian rule. Uh, when Judah was taken into exile to Babylon, Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 25, 11, This whole land shall be a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So it's probably the 70-year period that's being referred to here, that Tyre will be in decline and it will be under the rule of Babylon and people will forget about it and for a whole generation. Well, the song of the prostitute was a song that mocks a prostitute that's no longer popular, that's forgotten, and she, she's not looking so good anymore, you know? So this song is made to mock her. Um, Tyre will be like that. It will be uh, like a prostitute rejected and forgotten. In verse 17, at the end of 70 years, the Lord will visit Tyre. And she will return to her wages and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. So after the 70 years of decline, the Lord will allow Tyre to become uh, prominent again. It'll be back in business but Tyre's trade is likened to prostitution, uh, which the metaphor is that Tyre is willing to consort with any and all kings for profit. They're an anything-for-money kind of person. We're told in Scripture the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and that's Tyre for you. It's interesting that in Revelation, Babylon the Great is a mixture of Babylon and Tyre. You know, you have Babylon and then you have elements of Tyre as well. In Revelation 18, 2 through 3, it says, And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchandise of the earth have grown, or I'm sorry, the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. And you see some similarities here with Babylon and Tyre. Uh, but that idea of um, sexual immorality being mixed with trade, in luxurious living. That same mentality persists today in our world. You know, anything for money. Um, people make deals. People um, compromise what is right, what is good, all for the bottom line. And what will become of it all? You know, well, one day, one day God's going to deal with it, just like he did with Tyre. Uh, he will with Babylon the Great. But until then, you know, we listen to those words, come out of her, my people, you know, uh, that we don't give in 
to this world's mentality. Well, the last verse is awesome. It's a nice surprise ending after all this bad news. In verse 18, it says, Her merchandise and her wages will be holy to the Lord. It will not be stored or hoarded, but her merchandise will supply abundant food and fine clothing for those who dwell before the Lord. Check that out. The prostitute gets saved. You know, that's a good ending, right? Um, the Lord is able to now use her wealth for good. God's future plan of redemption for the people of Tyre and Sidon is real. And that is his heart, you know, for the lost world. Even though we might get tired of it and sick of it and mad at it and everything else, you know, God desires to see people get saved. This picture is of that future day of the messianic reign of Christ on earth when all nations will come and serve the Lord. But we see a process leading up to this fulfillment. When Jesus was on earth, he shared with the people from Tyre and Sidon. In Luke 16, 17, um, it says this, and he came down and went with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. Check that out. So now they're coming to hear Christ who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. Always good to see that there is hope for a messed up nation. But Jesus also actually went to Tyre and Sidon. You know, that first picture was him in Galilee and the people from Tyre and Sidon came to him. But then we see he went to Tyre and Sidon in Mark 7, 24. And from there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had been had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician, by birth, the very people that were being prophesied against here, but this little bit of good news, you know, points forward to her. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You know what she's talking about, um, you know, he's come, First for the Jew, but she's a Gentile. Um, and, he, and she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That's how desperate she is. She just wants her daughter to be healed. You know, she wants life. She wants Christ. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home. And found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. How cool is that? You know, so Christ goes there and ministers. Christianity was present in Tyre in the early days of the church. In the book of Acts 21, verse 2, it says, And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, you know, here, Phoenicia and ships together. It's like peanut butter and chocolate, right? Ships and Phoenicia, they go together. Uh, we went abroad and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. There were disciples there. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem and Anyway, it's, I think it's cool to look at these prophecies of doom and destruction and then go, well, God's got a plan of redemption. In this future day of the Lord, when the nations come to serve him, Tyre and Sidon will be among them. And they will be using their great merchant ability and their seafaring abilities to use their wealth for worship. 
And so instead of a prostitute, now Tyre is like a faithful uh, married spouse, you know, fully committed to the Lord. God's heart is to send his one and only son to this earth, you know, to die for the lost. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. Um, Christ said, I came to seek and save the lost. We're told in scripture, today is the day of salvation. You know, today if you hear his voice, um, respond. There will be a day when it's too late, but today's the day of salvation. And for those of us who know Christ, you know, that's kind of a wake-up call that the world has a timeline and there is an end date to their opportunity and we are the hands and the feet of Christ, you know. We have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. But God has a plan of redemption and he can do this in your life. If he could do it in the life of Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians, he can do it in your life. He can do it in the life of somebody around you. But I want to end with this application. To become rich towards God. You know, we're, we're talking about the materialism of the world, you know, that Tyre and Sidon represent. God has power over the greatest economies on earth, including ours. And I believe that God, well, we all know that God has a his own global reset plan, right? Um, man cannot stop it. It is his purpose. It is his plan. And with that in mind, we reassess what our lives are all about, you know? If all of the luxuries that we enjoy were taken away, what would our lives be about? Without um, Netflix, you know, without the internet, without our smartphones, without... <laughs> Um, rich coffee from other parts of the world. Fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, clothing, whatever luxury, wealth, entertainment that we enjoy today, what would our life be about? In Luke 12, 15 through 21, Jesus tells this story. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So what is your life about? Well, it's not about all the stuff. You know, it's not about all the possessions and the things that we get on our doorstep from Amazon and all that, even though it, it is quite fun to get a package <laughs> from Amazon and very uh, frustrating when it doesn't arrive the day it says it's supposed to be there, right? But our life does not consist of these things. But how much of our life is taken over by these things? And he told them a parable, and, and, and he said this. The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. That is convicting, isn't it? So... Being rich towards God. You know, what if we used all of our efforts and all of our focus and all of our time to be rich towards God? What would that even look like? Um, well, I think, number one, it would be putting your relationship with God first. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know, just like the person that trades stocks or a merchant wakes up thinking about what is today have for me, um, we would wake up and think, Lord, what do you have for me? 
putting him first, seeking his righteousness. Well, and if we do that, God's going to take care of our needs, you know? He doesn't necessarily give us our greeds, but he gives us our needs. Another way we're rich towards God is find contentment in your possessions. We don't realize how rich we are many times. Uh, even if we don't have as much as the Joneses, Joneses next door, right? But in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You'll even make a rich person envious when they see your contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we had food and clothing, with these will we, we will be content. But with those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. You know, that all the troubles of this world cause so much sorrow when we put those things first in our life. But when we are content with what we have, you know, and once in a while I'll slow down and realize the things God's given me and take like joy in what he's given me and even the simple things, you know, the simple things become a great joy when we're content. Well, the third thing I think that helps being rich towards God is giving thanks for God's provision. Thanks for everything. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you're ever wondering, what is God's will for my life? Start with, God, thank you for the breath I'm breathing. <laughs> you know, thank you for your son. Thank you for just the most simple things. The fourth way we can be rich towards God is give to others. In Acts 20, 34, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities. Paul's talking about he took care of his own needs by working hard. He didn't, uh, you know, fleece the flock or try to get money from people he was trying to minister to. And, and to those who were with me, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, you're rich towards God when you are generous, when you give. And if you haven't done that in a while, you know, maybe think of a way. How can I give? Lastly, is give God the credit. I was reading in my quiet time, and I came across Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And I, I was thinking to myself, what in the world does ascribe mean? You know, isn't there a better word they can choose <laughs> than ascribe? Because it's not like we use that word a lot. And um, so I, I spent a little time looking it up and remembering what it meant because I know I had looked it up in the past. I just couldn't remember what it meant. And so a scribe is like when you quote somebody in a book or a paper or whatever you write and you, you give credit to the person you quote, you know, you're ascribing to them, you're putting their name on it and saying this is so-and-so's idea and I'm sharing it with you. And so when we think of ascribing to the Lord, it's giving God credit for those things that oftentimes man is tempted to take credit for. Um, even heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory to his name. 
Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And so he's talking about um, the voice of the Lord like being thunder. And then it goes on a little later and it says the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness as lightning strikes and then you hear the, you know, and everything shakes. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare and the, in his temple all cry glory. Now, I like this a lot because I'm thinking about our scientific mind. You know, we think, okay, since I can understand how lightning works, then I can understand the mechanism for lightning and, and how um, it works out scientifically. We think God's not involved. You know, that somehow, now that I understand it, well, we don't need God for that. But actually, God's the one who created the laws of physics and nature and everything to work out a certain way. And so when we see the lightning and hear the thunder, science shouldn't steal our wonder of the experience. Um, you know, it's kind of like if we were to eat a piece of chocolate cake and we know what the ingredients are and since we know it's made of eggs and flour and all this stuff we could say you know it's it's you know if somebody was really dumb they could say well it's just a, a fancy omelet you know it's got eggs in it um but that's what we're like when we try to think of things scientifically and we don't think of the purpose behind it and the the taste that was intended in all the ingredients as they were put together and so the way that God put together creation and all the elements and the physical laws of the universe to create thunder and lightning, you know, we're meant to taste it and enjoy it and to give God the glory, you know. Um, and so even though we understand it, we ascribe to him credit. Anyway, that's stuck in my mind about being rich in the Lord. Because Tyre and Sidon, Babylon... They were the ones taking the credit, you know. Because I have wisdom or because I have power, they, they thought themselves to be a god. Well, being rich towards God, that's our great lesson, I think, as we look at this story of Tyre and Sidon and the prophecy, the oracle of their destruction, but also the good news of their redemption. Well, today we're going to, be able to wrap up with some worship. And uh, my worship leader plans fell through. So we're going to stop the live feed anyway and uh, go through some worship songs and have a chance to pray and stuff. So um, why don't we do that? So we're stopping the